Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames continue a long road trip, and they've had five of six points since we talked last. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, two games in St. Louis, one in Dallas this week. What are your overall thoughts on the week? I thought the Flames uh, were able to play well enough where they deserve to get five out of the six points. Well, let's jump into these. So the Flames had one of these really weird weeks that we're seeing in the NHL this week, this year, where they stay in the same city for more than one game. Um, we saw this before Christmas in San Jose, and I imagine the guys have no problem staying there. They can golf. Um, they did that in St. Louis this time. In the first game on the 10th, um, it was, well, an odd game. I'd say that the Flames in this one looked dominant for most of the first and second period, but I'm not quite sure what happened in the third here. Yeah, th- this was a game where, like, after the Chicago performance, uh, where Markstrom really shouldn't have started that game uh, and was pulled after the first period, I can understand the urge to want to go back to the well, but he looked tired uh, through the last handful of games that he started. And in this one frankly the goals that he surrendered in the third period were not good at all like both of them should have been relatively routine stops that both ended up in the back of the net which basically killed the flames momentum and the team had to adjust how they played to basically prevent any good scoring chances at all because they were just frankly afraid that markstrom was gonna allow any shot in you know, when you're up by three, or I guess not by three, but three to one after the second period, this should be your game. And I mean, we'll talk about this again with the Dallas game. But when you're when you got a three one lead after two, and then you end up blowing that to lose four to three, that really stings. Yeah, and this was one of those games where, like, I don't blame Markstrom for the game, even though he was directly responsible for the game going to overtime in the first place but you know the coaching staff has managed markstrom's game uh thus far this season rather poorly and he was not put in a position where he could be successful and it's been consistent Uh, like when uh markstrom was pulled from the net uh at the end of november early december um as soon as Markstrom got a start in, even though Vladar had been playing well the entire time. Then they just kept running with Markstrom instead of managing him. Like, he played well for a couple of the games, but then, like, the mistakes started cropping up again. And once again, Markstrom was getting in his own way. And, you know, like, you, I think that, like, with Markstrom, it's going to take more finesse with managing his minutes where you say, like, okay, Vladar, you're getting, like, say, the next three or four starts, then Markstrom goes in, whether he plays good or bad, we are going back to Vladar for another game or two, and, you know, you can base things off of that until Markstrom regains his confidence, but, you know, just letting him hang out to dry night in, night out, like, it's gonna ruin his season if it hasn't already. And I know this is being nitpicky, Matt, but uh, I was a little confused here. Were we playing the St. Louis Blues or the St. Louis Yellows? Why is a team called the Blues wearing a yellow jersey? Well, it was nice of the NHL to schedule an international game where Calgary played Team Sweden. That is what it looks like, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't have anything against yellow, but when you have a team that has a color in their name, like the Blue Jackets or the Blues, wear that color. Oh, I know. It, it's sort of like when they the Blue Jackets had their reverse retro red jerseys, and it's like... Then they're red um, jackets. They're not blue jackets. <laughs> yeah, like that's a different thing. <laughs> or the Golden Knights. Like, you know, it, you're putting the color in your name. Wear the darn color. Yeah. like it, it, Yeah. It, it would I be have... like giving Vegas a silver jersey. It'd be like, K-Y. Because <laughs> they had to ship them over from Henderson. He got the wrong order. Ah, uh, I see. Um, there you go. For those that don't know, the Vegas Golden Knights farm team is the Henderson Silver Knights. Yeah, and uh, I would hope that their ECHL team was the Bronze Knights just because that Yeah, they, would they would be funny, but they don't own the, the team, unfortunately. Too bad. It, it's too bad they're not like the Kings, Queens, and Jacks or something like that. 
Um, yeah. These Blues jerseys, though, have to be one of the the worst uh, reverse retro jerseys. Uh, they weren't too too. One too thing horrible, I noticed but... on them and it bothered me: the shoulder just like stops. It's like somebody forgot to round it off or put something on the end. The yoke just like stops nowhere. Yeah. Okay, that's enough color for you. Done. Yeah, it, I don't know. It just like the flames are rounded, you know, like there's some sort of logical end to it. I don't know. It just bothered me. Yeah. Uh, those, well, frankly, this iteration of the reverse retros, there's only been like maybe five that were good, and like the rest are all mediocre to horrific. And I think the St. Louis one is uh, walking that line between mediocre and horrific. Well, the Calgary Flames got one point out of that game, losing uh, 4-3 in overtime. Then they had Wednesday the 11th off, and Daryl Sutter, of course, in his Daryl Sutter fashion, went to visit the uh, the Budweiser horses, and that's a very Daryl Sutter thing to do on your day off. I mean, what says Sutter better than that? Yeah, pretty much. Like, if you were to, like, make a trope about Sutter, that would basically be right in line. So... Yeah, doesn't surprise me at all. No, the the fact that he takes his day off to go visit Clyde doesn't mean there's probably not a lot to do in St. Louis. It's not like, you know, being in California before Christmas, they can go golfing or whatever. But, yeah, it's Sutter going to see the Clydesdales. That's that's very on brand. Mm-hmm. And then Thursday, they played the Blues again in St. Louis. This time, uh, Dan Vladar in the net for this one. And the Calgary Flames pick up a 4-1 to one lead. Uh, Calgary got three goals in the third period here. I thought this was a great Flames effort, and I I don't know about you, but I think this might be the closest to a 60-minute effort we've seen this team play this year. Yeah, and we've seen through most of the games thus far this season where the Flames are basically one goal either way, and so it was nice to see the the Flames manage a three-goal win uh, for a change, and this is a, the marked difference between what we've seen from Markstrom lately and Vladar is all of the routine shots went were saved uh, by Vladar and all of the more, aver- you know, decent to good chances uh, were also stopped by Vladar. It was just that weird breakdown uh, where the puck squirted out to neighbors that you know, he was not in position for because it was a bit of a broken play. But other than that, you know, like he was on point with all of his uh, positioning and making the routine and not routine saves. And Markstrom uh, has been struggling with that. And that's why I'd like to see the Flames continue with Ladar for the near future. Um, Walker Dewar gets his first ever NHL goal in this one. I believe he becomes the first ever NHL player from South Dakota to score a goal. And first ever player from South Dakota. So, hey, he's number one regardless. There you go. So, uh, and yeah, he'll be, he'll, he'll be in, in the history books. Yeah. He'll be that random trivia guy that you're like, oh, okay. That's right. 20 years from now, we'll, we'll be doing, uh, trivia in the nursing home and we'll remember Walker Dewar. Mm-hmm. Maybe 40 years from now. Um, but yeah, I would say in this one, I thought Dan Vladar looked like a starting goalie, to your point. Like, he didn't look like, you know, the backup in on a back to back or the second night against the same team. He looked like a starter. Yeah. And there's a level of confidence in his game. Even in the Dallas game where, you know, he did surrender five goals, he still looked good. Um, but that, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, let's talk about that one. So Calgary played the Dallas Stars. This was a matinee game on Saturday. Uh, this was, what, a noon Calgary start? And Calgary got up 6-1. to one. Like, by the, by the you know, midway point in the second period, it was 6-1 Calgary. Then Dallas comes back to make it 6-5. Like, to me, yeah, I'm glad you get up 6-1, but they're lucky they didn't lose that one. Yeah, this was a typical afternoon game where nothing makes sense at all. <laughs> like the frankly like the one goal should not have counted for uh the Flames, the Cadre goal with Huberto uh leaping in the air to get catch the puck and putting himself up offside. That one really shouldn't have 
logically counted, even though it was inconclusive. And, like, every everything with this game was weird. Like, you had, like, the first goal was a weird where one where it deflected off a flame right to Delandria, who made a quick and smart pass across to Jamie Ben. You had uh, Pavelski scoring on a net that was off its moorings. Uh, you know, just, like, everything seemed really random in this game, whether it was the Flames scoring or the Stars scoring. It's not like either team had, like, consistent, consistent pressure throughout a long stretch that resulted in a goal. It was just like, oh, and they scored. And it, it was just a very odd game. Yeah, I would not say that after two periods, Calgary is playing like they should have a 6-1 lead. No, like it realistically, the game should have, like if it was an evening game where things were normal, pro Calgary probably wins that one 4-3 to three or 3-2, three to two. but it, it just, it, it was a silly game, and you know, those kind of games happen, the Flames did manage to shut the door once uh, Dallas got within a goal. And that's all that you really need. Um, you know, like, sometimes weird things happen and your ability to respond to the bizarre is very important. And we saw that a lot in the Edmonton series where, like, the Flames would take absurd leads and then blow it. And, you know, if the Flames can learn in situations like this where, okay, yeah, you had a four-goal lead, five-goal lead, and you've given up four goals, well, you can now shut the door and not get railroaded into a loss. It almost felt like it was the Flames saved by the bell here, doesn't it? Like, if this game went on for five, ten more minutes, I'm not sure the Flames would have had the, the win. Yeah, that very well could be. So, I guess good for the Flames for scoring six, but... Guys, you got to be able to shut it down when you're up by five. Yeah, that whole game was just a very bizarre game. Like, like there's a normal flow when teams start to score goals, and like it, even on both sides, like that flow just didn't really seem to happen. It was very arbitrary. Like, oh, the puck's randomly in the net, and it it just it was a weird game. Yeah, and I'd say it's been a bit of a weird road trip. I mean, if you you know you look back even to games here, I mean Calgary you know loses to Chicago, and then you know loses one to St. Louis, then gets the two wins there. Like you know, great game against the Islanders. This team, well, I guess the Islanders before the road trip, but you know even these this month, like I don't know, Calgary just they've been losing the teams they need to be winning. They've been beating the teams I guess they should be losing. I don't know what to make of them right now. Well, and the thing is, is that if you look at just pure points, um, the Flames aren't doing too badly. Um, like, if you count the two overtime losses to St. Louis and Chicago as one win and one loss, the four teams that are kind of mediocre that the Flames have played this month, uh, the Flames have won three out of the four. You know, they, they're they really 2-0-2, uh, two -oh and two, but, you know for sake of argument, points-wise. And the two good teams being Winnipeg and Dallas, they've split one apiece. So, you know, like, it, being 4-2 and two equivalent um, through the six games, that's fairly good. Um, not, you know, has On it been paper, pretty... yeah, the results. But when you look at the way the team's actually playing, like, I'm, I still don't think they've got everything together. No, and that's where the benefit of actually running into a bit of an easier schedule, um, you know, you're playing teams that have problems and that you can capitalize on, even though it, it's not ideal. Like, uh, you know, like getting two points out of Chicago and St. Louis when, you know, like if the Flames were playing a good team, they lose both of those in regulation. It, it just... Well you know, it's well, let's, kind of let's come back to that idea yeah. of the schedule, but let's talk about where the flames actually sit right now. Yeah. Um, flames right now are in the number one wild card spot. So in the Pacific division, the Vegas golden Knights are first with 58 points. Seattle is second with 56 points. LA third with 56 points. Calgary, uh, 51 points. We have 44 games played 21 wins, 14 losses, nine overtime losses. Edmonton tied with us for 51 points and then Colorado way down at 45. So, you know, Matt, I mean, we've seen the flames in worse positions this year, but like you said, they're not in a bad position and 
you've talked a lot about this schedules, you know, for the next little bit being an easier schedule for the Flames. But even by that, I don't know, like, you got to be beat in Chicago. Yeah, and, like, realistically, like, if Markstrom was not struggling epically in those two games, the Flames have two more points than they do. Uh, and, like, they should have coasted to easy wins against both Chicago and St. Louis. And, frankly, those two points being missing is due to Daryl Sutter uh, and his game management of uh, Markstrom throughout the last month and a bit. And, you know, it, it's so, tough uh, because, like, you can see that Markstrom, is, his problems are not anything other than between his own ears. And, like, when he makes a mistake, everything goes bad for him. And he can't seem to recover. And, uh, like, giving up the goal right off the hop, uh, which he did a couple of times, it, then it just spirals for him. And, like, that goal against St. Louis in the third period, the first one, like, he should have caught the initial shot, but it, he missed it. It bounced off him right to the St. Louis player for a tap-in. And if he didn't have that momentary lapse, that goal wouldn't have happened. And because he was rattled from it, Kairou was able to tie it right after. Like all Even outside of the goalie, though, it feels to me like the, the, the 18 guys in front of him seem like they play more confidently when Vladar is in net. Like, yeah. when I look at... St. Louis game one versus St. Louis game two. I just saw a different level of, I don't want to say even commit or compete, but they just looked more confident with Dan Vladar in that. Well, and you have to play the game differently. And I think that that you're seeing that. that Like, if your goalie is prone to making a mistake and then imploding on himself, it becomes necessary to basically try and prevent anything from reaching him that could possibly be a good scoring chance uh, because you're like oh well that's surely gonna go in uh, you know because you no, don't have any confidence that the goalie can make a save whereas with Vladar he's not being prone to those kind of mistakes so they can just play their game confidently and just establish their own game instead of reacting to the other team and you know, like the Flames, to their credit, were able to shut the Blues down after uh, Markstrom allowed those two goals. But you could see that, like, they were not really generating any scoring chances from that point either. And like, it it made sense that the game went to overtime. Um, it, it's just it's difficult because Markstrom did not magically forget how to be a good goaltender. It's just that he his confidence is shot and. When a goalie is is in that situation, like you kind of have to manage them with kid gloves and like make it so that way, like whether they're having a good performance or a bad performance, that it's not going to affect the schedule of like what when the other guy plays or when they play again. And I think that like Markstrom is very much reacting of like, oh well, if I make a mistake, I'm not going to see the. Mu- uh, puck again for another month and it, instead of focusing on the right things of having his head in the game properly and we saw that briefly when he came back for like three or four games uh, back in December where he was really good but then things ebbed off again and he's been the up and down goalie that we've seen since so, I mean, we really haven't seen, a, uh, I would say, a season like this from Markstrom, even before he came to the Flames. No. I can't remember him ever being this inconsistent. And I don't know if it was the Edmonton series last year that shook him or what, but you you and I have talked about, you know, if Daryl Sutter's maybe the, the right coach here, maybe we got to turn that to Jordan Siglett and the goalie staff. Like, you know, if him and LaBarbera and that sort of thing can't get this goalie turned around... Do we look at it as a goalie problem? Do we look at it as a goalie coaching problem? Where do you put some of that blame? Well, and I think it, it stems actually to the first round where Markstrom needed to be pitcher perfect because he couldn't make a mistake. And then, uh, you know, because Ottinger was just being ridiculous in that series. And, you know, he was able to elevate his game. And then 
the next series, like right off the hop, you had that really weird 9-6 game where like everybody was making mistakes and the pucks were going in left, right, and center. And, you know, to go from the one drastic thing to like, oh, well, we made a whole bunch of mistakes but still won, it just kind of like I think broke his mentality on that aspect and he just has not been able to recover fully yet but it, it, it's tough because uh, like this is not like an injury problem where like oh the guy he hurt his knee and so he's still rehabbing it and his reaction times aren't quite up to snuff it's all between the ears and it's hard uh, to manage well, that's what that I'm kind saying, of thing. Though. Like if the, I mean, these goalie coaches, Siglet and LaBarbera, I mean, they've been in those kind of scenarios. They know what that's going through. Hopefully they're having that dialogue with Jacob and he's saying, you know what, guys, this is doing some to me. And you'd hope that in the off season, he was working with the team psychologist or the goalie coaches or whatever he needed. Like, it just seems weird that he comes in mentally broken and we seem to have no, no fix for it. You know, like sometimes players have that happen. And are easily able to square the circle and get, you know, back on track. And then other times there's, like, a guy that played baseball in the 90s, Chuck Knobloch, who was, like, a perennial all-star. Then all of a sudden he just could not throw a ball to first base at all. Like, he'd miss every time, practically. And he ended up having to retire because he just could not, you know, get it out of his head. And... You know, stuff like that does happen. And, and you know, I mean, I was willing to give Jacob some time at the beginning of the season, but at this point, it's starting to cost the Flames standings. And, you know, I'm starting to wonder if Jacob's ever going to rebound from this. Well, and that's where, like, uh, that's one of the main reasons why I'd like the Flames to just kind of sit him for a while and you know like if uh Vladar is capable just let him go and for like the next handful of games and then then when you decide to put Markstrom in don't put him in for consecutive games let him have the one game if he does well good to know and then go back to Vladar for a couple more and then ease Markstrom back in with like a game like every third game every fourth game until you know you're starting to get that consistency of him playing well night in at night out when he's actually in the lineup and then you know eventually flip it back to Markstrom once he's on a bit of a personal role at that point but it's, you know, it's deja vu. We've had this discussion earlier in the season, but I don't disagree with you. I think at this point, I mean, Dan Vladar is the better of the two goalies right now. And I think you've got to now start looking at Dan Vladar as the starting goalie of this team. Yeah. And whether that continues for a long time or the rest of the year, who knows? And, you know, if Vladar, <laughs> say, plays lights out the rest of the way, then that brings a different you know, tenor of the conversation. It's just one of those where, you know, you have to just kind of wait and see. And I, I think trading marks from more with kid gloves and just allowing him to work through his issues instead of like, okay, well, you're the supposed to be the starter. So you're just going to start whether you're doing good or bad and you know, whatever happens happens. And, like, it's not good for Marks or more of the Flames at that point. I was having this debate uh, this weekend on Twitter um, with a few fans with our Ad Fireside podcast account. And it's not going to happen, but somebody had an interesting point that was chatting on there and said, you know, Nobody has any money right now. Wave Marks from and send him to the Wranglers to work this out. No one will claim him. And I'm like, in theory, yeah, that's the right move, but no, that's not going to happen. No, like that that's just mean-spirited. Well, and then what do you do? You run uh, Dansk and and Vladar as your pair? Yeah. I well, either that or you bring Wolf up and, you know, have the kid can't, kid tandem. But I mean, but they're doing well in in uh in you know the AHL, they don't want to tank that team either. So if he needs to work through stuff, you almost got to make him Wolf's backup. I know, yeah. like son, you've been demoted. Like yeah, and that's not good for anybody. Like 
And that's where, like, the Flames just need to find a way of putting Markstrom in a place where he can be successful in his his own game. And, like, right now, we're just not seeing that. And that's the frustrating and tough part because, like, he is a better goalie than what he has been this season, uh, without a doubt. And... I think this is more an aberration than like what you're going to get from Markstrom moving forward. It's just that he needs to be able to be in a space where he can actually work through the problems and, you know, come out the other side properly instead of trying to shoehorn just because, oh, you're supposed to be the guy. I mean, we've tried Markstrom now. We've given him some time off. We have put him back in. We've done the goalie hokey pokey and... It's not working out. We're not turning our, our stats around, and that's what it's all about in the hokey pokey. So, you know, I think at this point we've got, what, six games left? We've got Nashville, Colorado, Tampa Bay, Columbus, Chicago, Seattle. I think I would probably play Dan Vladar in all of those except maybe the Tampa Bay game and let uh, because that's the one that I'd be okay to drop some points in. Maybe the Columbus game, the two Eastern Conference games. Yeah. But I think I would play... Dan Vladar and all the Western Conference games. Yeah, I agree. Um, and let him run the rest of January as the starter and see what happens after that. No, and like, how would you say, like, if uh, he, uh, you know, like, say the next couple of games you put Vladar in for Nashville, Colorado, um, allowing Markstrom to be back in against Tampa Bay, um, like, that's a solid test for him. And yeah. I think that, like, he needs to be able to be. Like, it, it's also hard when you're having this particular problem and you're playing a bad team because it kind of magnifies everything. Because it's like, oh, well, we should easily beat whomever, but, you know, then you allow one or two bad mistakes and, like, it just makes it worse. So, like, having a team like Tampa who's, you know, viably good themselves... I think would be an excellent test for Marks from when he draws back in. But I, I And I think if I'm the Flames, I almost circle out on a calendar for him. And I say, okay, Jacob, you're out until this game. I mean, unless, you know, we need you to do relief duties or something. But mentally, do what you've got to do and work with our goaltending team to get ready for this game. This is the next time you're starting. Yeah. And be blunt so, with him of you're not seeing the ice unless, you know, like the Flames go up six goals or something. And well, even if they're up six goals, I probably wouldn't put him in. I'd keep, yeah. you know, unless I, I think you're only seeing the ice if Dan shoots the bed. Yeah. But, you know, like you be ready for this game. You've got how many days? You've got one, two, three, four, five days to figure things out. Do what you've got to do. Work with the goaltending team here. Work with the psychologist. You know, sacrifice a goat, whatever you've got to do to be ready. Go do that. Those things. Mm hmm. And if you need if you need a couple days off, we'll bring Dansk up. Like you know, do what you got to do. I agree. But but I think that you know you've at some point I think Daryl's given him as much leash as we can give him right now, and you know we can't let him work whatever it is out on the ice because that's not working. And Dan Vladar is working. And I think at this point we've got to just say you know what, run Dan Vladar, give him a give marks from a date when he needs to be ready by, and if he's not ready. You don't keep going back to him. Like, if he doesn't look good in Tampa, Vladar's back in for Columbus. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think in that situation, like, I would have Vladar, like, even if Markstrom, say, posted a 38-save shutout against Tampa Bay, I would still go back to Vladar the next game just so it takes the mental load off of Markstrom of, like, okay, this happened this game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, and not having, like, mistakes from previous games rolling over, which I think that you saw, like, in his more recent starts. That's where, a good point. Yeah. You know, and where he can just, like, okay, well, my next start is against, you know, insert team here, but, you know, like, a, a few days later, like, you know, three or four and, games later. Well, and then the end of the month, we have Chicago, Seattle back-to-back -back for a week by, uh, before our bye week. So I would probably put him in in the Seattle game, yeah. the very last one of those, so he gets the time, and then he's got another week off. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so, you know, I just I think right now we've we've given Jacob Markstrom as much leash as we can. He's not getting the job done, so we got to put the we got to play the goalie hokey pokey. we got to bring uh, 25 out and put 80 in. we got to 
you know, put 25 out, put it 80 in and shake them all about. Like we just gotta, we gotta do this. Yeah. We gotta make the change if we, because if we keep going back to the Markstrom well, I feel like the flames are going to fall out of contention. Well, no. And like, if, well, how do you say, like even moving forward into next season, like if say like the flames, uh, like finish third or fourth in our division or just miss the playoffs and you know, like that will haunt Markstrom into next year and then you you might end up with a repeat where he's just as bad if not worse next year and you know like in order to get him onto the right track you know they have to manage it correctly and you know going back to that well all the time if he's not ready for it could be just as much of a disaster well and for a team that is probably looking to shed some money next year if Markstrom can't come out of this funk. I'm going to be curious to see what they do there because he's going to be... I mean, if we look at this season and Dan Vladar becomes the established number one, Markstrom is all of a sudden a very expensive backup. Well, and to be frank, like with the amount of goalies around the NHL, trading Markstrom, just, you know, not that we're advocating... right winger for um, You know, like we could easily move that... Because there sure. are a number and, of teams, and we could probably fetch the you know middle six right winger we need. Yeah, like the, the there's always going to be a team that like oh we have a slightly overpriced forward here, and you know we'll trade for your slightly overpriced goalie there, and you yeah. know work it even out. Even if it's and I don't want to compare you know him to being as lousy a player as James Neal, but even something like the James Neal deal where it's you know bad money for bad money, but two guys that just needed to trade. Yeah. And I'm not saying Markstrom's now bad money, but if Markstrom becomes your backup, he's bad money. Yeah, and Markstrom's good enough where, like, you know, you can insert pretty much any name of any non-playoff team um, that would like to have some stability between the pipes, um, that, like, they would like a guy like a Markstrom for three years, like, especially if they're rebuilding just to have a serviceable guy in net where they don't have to think about it and just let their prospects do their thing. Until they are ready, I agree. Yeah, you know, like but, say, uh, like know, not, say, like saying... Arizona, just as an example, like that would make sense. It, you and know. you're not going to see that deal done at the deadline. That would be an off season deal if the team, you know, does their exit interviews with Markstrom and still thinks, you know, what he's not ready to be the starter next year. And you know, I think that's a long shot, but it's something that I think is becoming more and more a possibility with every bad game. That you know what. Markstrom's time as a starter might be done in this league. Well, and especially like it might be done here with how. Or maybe that's a better way to say it. Markstrom's time as the fl- as a flame might be over. Yeah, and you know the thing is that like with having Wolf playing so well in uh, the farm, and then Chechilev playing well where he's at, and then Sergeyev playing well where he's at. Like, the Flames are really flush with good young goaltenders. Tell me the only goalie not playing well is Markstrom. <laughs> Pretty much. And Dansk. Yeah, well, Dansk is... Actually, Dansk isn't looking bad. Let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, for an AHL backup, he's not looking bad. No. It, it, and, you know, the, like, not to be slamming Markstrom, but he pretty much is the only goalie in the Flames organization that's not doing well. But, you know, not to pile on him, like, it, it, he very much can be the Vesna caliber goalie he was last year. And it's just, he has to get out of his own way. And I think that, you know, like instead of dwelling on like, Oh, I made one minor error here and that just snowballs. I think he needs to like learn how to have a little bit shorter of a memory and like kind of like, well, and that's something as a 32 year old starter, you would assume he has like, that's kind of what I was getting to about the goaltending staff here. Like this is not a new starter. This is not a guy like David Riddick who learned how to be a, an NHL starter when he was here. We acquired this guy as an NHL starter. That's a skill you expect he has. And if not, is that something we need to coach him on better? Like, where, you know, what's the issue there? Because he didn't have that last year. No. He'd have a bad loss and he'd be okay. So is that a him problem? Is that a coaching problem? Like, I, I don't know where that's coming from all of a sudden. Yeah. And that's where, like, the Flames have to manage him better, period. 
So Matt, every time we talk about a player on the show, I add them as a tag uh, to the website so people can search for that name. This is the first time we've mentioned Oscar Dansk. That's the f- nice. He doesn't show up in previously used tags. Nice. So at least now Oscar Dansk is getting his due. Yeah. So now everybody Dansk now. That's right. That's what they. That's what they should say if he gets a shutout. Yeah. I'll bring that up to the communications team. Um. But yeah, no, I think it's, you know, I think, and this is what I think is interesting. It's not like Markstrom is playing bad, so therefore let's go to Vladar because he's the best we've got. Vladar is looking like, in my opinion, a National Hockey League starter for a playoff team. Like we've got one goalie moving up and one goalie going down. And I think Vladar has earned that net. It's not just you're the next guy up, son. He's earned that net. Yeah, no, and Vladar throughout his career um, being over here, like he in the AHL with Providence, he was a dominant goalie in the AHL, and then he got recalled to the Bruins because he was playing so well and played serviceable minutes uh, on the Bruins. Um, it just so happened that Boston happens to be a goalie factory at the moment, as we see with Olmark and Swayman uh, being so dominant. But uh, you know. It, something had to give he got traded to here and you know like there's nothing in his pedigree that says that he's on any other trajectory other than being a starting goalie in the nhl so you know if he emerges as that well that's just awesome and he's looking solid and composed most games and like even when he gives up five goals like against dallas it it was a very random ish game where like, it wasn't that he was giving up soft goal after soft goal. Like, they were all very random goals. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's one of those where it's always good to have good young goaltenders, and you just need one of them to turn out. <laughs> so if that happens to be Vladar, then that's just awesome. And we'll see. You know, I mean, Vladar, and I say this every time we talk about Vladar, but we've got him locked up now for two more years after this at $2.2 million. If he does become our starter, let's just assume next year it's Vladar and Wolf. And, you know, can you imagine a playoff team play, paying their goaltending tandem less than $3 million? That's unheard of. Yeah, well, that would be hilarious um, if that worked out. But um... I mean, at that point, you know, you had sort of $8 million budgeted for the two of them you could go out and find yourself even another nice backup but i'm still not convinced i want wolf up here next year i think if i was going for i'd get a a season nhl backup yeah with wolf um i think that like at some point this year we're gonna see him recalled and actually play a game or two (laughs) there's the there's the question i was gonna ask recalled or recalled and played uh because of the fact that like especially at the end of the season because the last eight games that the flames play are all against really bad teams um so like assuming the flames have a playoff spot locked up at that point and like perhaps like divisional races are kind of over at that point um, I would not not be shocked if Wolf got a game or two at the end just to see what he has at the NHL level and, you know, um, evaluate for next year. And, like, if he looks serviceable, that might, you might just say, well, throw him in. If not, you know, and sign, like, a veteran guy for Stockton who could be an NHL backup as well. And... Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, let's let's deal with that when we get there. I I uh, I you know my thoughts on um AHL players and I like AHL players to overmature and I think especially with a goaltender like Wolf, I'd rather he overmatures as an AHL starter than maybe hinder his development sitting on the bench in the NHL. True. And for a guy like Vladar who has had one good starter year, I'm not sure we trust him enough to, you know, get rid of Markstrom, bring in the kid, and keep going. I think you almost need that 1B guy just in case. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Um, well, Matt, you mentioned you know calling him up and starting him, which I think is uh, has been the little bit of a farce over the last week. So Radham Zahorna sent back to the Wranglers on Sunday, but the guy who's still here is Jacob Peltier, and Jacob Peltier has been brought up. He was recalled before the Chicago game. He's on this road trip. 
but he's yet to play, which I have to scratch my head at. Like, this is probably the top prospect in the Flames organization. He's not playing, and it makes me wonder, is there a disconnect right now between management and coaching? It seems like we saw this with Phillips. He came up. He didn't play for a couple of games. When he did play, maybe it wasn't used as effectively. Now we're seeing that with Peltier. Do you think that there's a disconnect between Treliving saying, I'm bringing these guys up, and Daryl saying, I'm not going to play them? Yeah, well, like Treliving even said when he recalled Peltier that he wanted, was looking forward to seeing him play so he could evaluate him at the NHL level. And realistically, like there's a month and a half between now and the trade deadline, and the Flames need to know if they need to get a second line forward. And when you have two of the elite scorers in the AHL that are both prospects, you need to see if one of those two guys can actually cut it as that top six forward. And and this would have been a great week for Peltier. Chicago, St. Louis, like, you know, teams that we should be beating. Yeah, and like even, like, if he doesn't start against Nashville, you know, like, something's really wrong with this and it, it's getting to a point where like start waving veteran guys and sending them to the, to the farm <laughs> give Daryl no choice yeah like literally send Dewar down uh, dress only 12 forwards you got 12 guys send stone down <laughs> like hold, hold him ransom don't make me take Trevor Lewis away from you don't make me do it yeah waiver paperwork's filled out it's in the fax machine I'll press the button yeah. don't make me press it I know, like, make it so that, like, the Flames only have six forwards and 12, or six defensemen and 12 forwards. Don't do that. Then you'll take your advice and you'll convert one of our defensemen well, to a forward. Well, that's why. Like, get rid of the extra defensemen, too. <laughs> because then you'll see 11 forwards and seven defensemen, then. And Like, you know, you and I had a, a serious discussion before Christmas as to if Daryl Sutter's maybe pass his best before date here. And we've seen from Daryl in the past... You know, the and I guess his reputation even coming into Calgary this time around was Daryl likes the veterans, Daryl doesn't like the rookies. But as you said, we've got two of the top scorers in the American League. We're not saying put these guys in the first line, but put them into the Chicago game. Like, that's the game to play them. Put them into one of the St. Louis games. You're not going to hurt yourself by taking Lewis or somebody like that out. He played Walker Dewar. No, and I also have to qualify, like, putting Zahorna and Dewar in the lineup, I actually am perfectly th glad. For sure, because they fit on the fourth yeah, line. And, you know, like, moving forward, you know, like, seeing Zahorna and Dewar at the NHL level, like, can they cut it? And, you know, like, if you have big guys that are fast and can play with some physicality like Zahorna, like Dewar... That that's a really good fourth line. So like For I have sure. no problem with those guys getting no, used. No, me neither. It's but I guess just, when I saw those two guys come up, I thought, well, Zahorn is here. Is Dewar's going to be the extra body of these call ups? Yeah, and instead Zahorna gets pulled. Peltier sits, and everybody's scratching well, their head. And that's weird too. It's like Walker Dewar's still here. Zahorna's going back down. Like that's not the way I saw this one going. No, and you know, to his credit. Um, Dewar has played well and you know he's an interesting player and like he might actually be a good NHL player moving forward yeah um which and that would be great and uh, I have no problem with that and like it, you know you see like Ruzitska another young player that has been able to be folded into the lineup properly over the last two seasons and that's great the thing is is that all those guys are over six feet two and Pelte and Phillips, who are Gaudreau sized or thereabouts, are not getting a shot. And, you know, like it's confounding, like, especially when, like, the Flames have had guys like Gaudreau, like Munjapane, like Dubé, uh, who's slightly taller than the, those two, uh, be successful and, like, become legitimate top six forwards like the two of those Manjapane and uh, Gaudreau had 76 goals between them last year you know it's not the same NHL where you know like you had you know like Theron Fleury was the only short guy in the league uh you know like they're like Cole Caulfield has like 25 or 26 goals and he's smaller than Phillips and it's like at what point are you just being stubborn because oh we don't like short people and you know it, it it this is one of those things where like it's going to damage the organization because 
you know, like you, you look at Matthew Coronado, who's the Flames' top prospect, who's lighting up the NCAA and looking like a possible 30, 40 goal scorer in the NHL. I wouldn't sign with Calgary. You know, I, I'd walk because, you know, the coaching staff's not going to respect that I can actually score. He's just going to discriminate because, oh, I'm five foot seven. Well, it, it's just a lot of BS, frankly. And, like, it, this has to be rectified. And, like, the, these guys have to be able to play. Like, they've earned their spots. Yeah, and, and you and I talked last show about where do you, you know, who do you take out to put him in? And I still think right now the best thing to do is move Lucic back to line four, scratch Lewis, and put uh, Peltier on the Kadri Huberto line. I agree. And like, yeah, it, and just do, and it doesn't mean it's forever. Try it for one game. Yeah. When you had two St. Louis games, try it for one of those. Like, it's just, I don't know. Like, I, I like Daryl. I think Daryl's a good coach, but at some point, You've got to you got to look at the bird in hand. It's not like Daryl's never seen these guys. Daryl's son's playing for the Wranglers. Daryl's at almost every Wranglers home game. He's seen these kids play. Give him a shot. Yeah, no, and it's not like um, his teams have been adverse to youth. Even the Flames uh, currently are like they have a lot of good young players in the lineup um, that are under the age of twenty six. It's just that. You know, just because you have your two best scorers in uh, the farm happen to be five foot seven and five foot eight, you know, it, it's like, yeah, okay, that, you know, like, would I prefer those guys being over six feet tall? Yeah, but I, I think anybody who has a short star caliber talent would like their guy to be taller just because it's easier to fit them in well, and we're not saying put the whole team under six feet like no you know when we go to anaheim we don't want this whole team to not be able to ride the roller coaster like you know one guy no i know and like you look at like tampa bay like they were able to win the cup with the several guys who are short and you know and to be honest we don't know that's why daryl's not doing it no. we're assuming based on his pedigree but Whatever the reason is, like like you said, Treliving's bringing these guys up because he wants to see them. If Daryl's not playing them, it does make you wonder if there's some disagreement going on there. And if so, I mean, you know, maybe not mid-season, but at the end of the season, if you're Treliving, do you have to take a good hard look and say, I need a guy who's going to be playing our youth? Yeah, and, it, you know, it's frustrating because... Like, in a lot of ways, like, the Flames are playing a very good way of playing like playoff caliber hockey where you know by and large like when it comes to the third period although not a couple of games this past week but in general like they're out shooting their opponents heavily and outscoring their opponents heavily um again not this week but <laughs> and you know and they're being effective at shutting games down when they're you know, just because of their defensive systems. And, like, the main area that they're lacking is offensive skill. And, you know, like, that's what's even more confounding is that you have, like, two really dynamic forwards that you're not playing because of reasons. And, you know, like, it just doesn't make sense, really. And it's not like Peltier or Phillips are slow or not skilled or whatever, like, or are, you know, like both, uh, Phillips and Peltier are physical guys, uh, despite their size and are willing to engage. So it's, it's just very bizarre. To and me. I mean, we've seen times in the past with various teams where the GM and the head coach are on different pages. Maybe the GM thinks, you know, we're not doing as well as we are or something like that. Um, but it, I mean, even coming into the season, Daryl Sutter admitted it's going to be harder to score goals. We need to find, you know, new place for the goals to come from. So, like, you know, Daryl's kind of admitting that we, we have some scoring woes. It's not like we're the number one team in the West. I could see if we're the number one team and Brad says, change your lineup, put this kid in. Eh, maybe I don't want to change it there, but we're we're underperforming. Like, I see no reason not to do this. Yeah, and, like, especially, like, it would be one thing, like, if the Flames' defense was bad and their offense was carrying them, but it's the exact opposite. Like, their defense has been their strength this year, 
and they can't score. And so getting two dynamically offensive, talented players to add to the lineup. And, and I'm not even saying put them both in at the same time. No. And, you know, like try them one at a time. Don't take one guy out of the lineup. Like we're not saying, you know, take every big guy you've got out. And if they want to keep big guys in, they should be keeping Zahorna here. Like there's your big guy. But, you know, I mean, yeah, just I, I don't know. The whole thing is confusing to me. Like. We're not saying thou shall play this guy from now until, you know, game 82. Put him in for a game, two games, three games. Just see what they got. Yeah, and give him, like, a and, legit and, shot instead of, like, what you did yeah. with Phillips where, okay, you got two shifts a period, and, okay, that's enough of you. Well, that's it. And it's almost like, you know, I don't know, you almost need negotiation between the coach and GM. Like, okay, Brad, I'll put him in for one game. We'll see how he does. Oh wow, he did well. Okay, well, can you put him in for another game, Daryl? Like, no, and just... like that's where it's getting ridiculous to the point where like, do you start putting guys on waivers and sending them to the farm, uh, just to get you know? Down if, to 12... if we're gonna be that absurd, I think it's time to change the coach. Yeah, no, I know, and like it's getting to like, that if point. You're, if you're forcing the coach to play your young guy, just change the coach. Yeah, I know, and it you know especially with how the team has struggled overall like it, you know it, you want to change things up like we yeah and and we had that discussion before christmas and i think i'm not advocating that we should but if the f- team fires daryl you put kirk muller as the interim head coach you let him know you know kirk you're playing these guys do you want that interim tag to come off next year or not if you do consider playing these guys yeah well no and it, it's difficult because like this team does have a lack of scoring right Mm -hmm. and they need to know what they've got in order to address the trade deadline properly in order to for living to do his due diligence to go out and get somebody to help you need to know what guy you need and Mm -hmm. if you don't know because your coach is refusing to play your two prospects so you can't tell what you've got because you know who who knows like if you play phillips with say cadre and huberdo he might just step in and play at roughly the same pace that he's in in the AHL, and like that line goes gangbusters. Could happen, or at least looks good enough. I yeah. mean, we've talked about this before. I don't think Dylan Dubé is a top line winger, but hey, you know what? He's looking good there. You know, he'll do good enough. Yeah, and that's one of those where, you know, like if you put those guys in, and you know, like they take off. Well, then you don't need to go spend a first round pick plus to go get this year's iteration of Tyler Toffoli just because, oh, well, we don't know what we have, so we, but we do have a hole, so we're just going to go get insert veteran here. Like, it's just, yeah. Like, the coaching staff is not helping the organization at all. Well, and the thing that confuses me too, like you've got Ryan Huska as an assistant coach who has, you know, a, a history in the AHL. You got Kale McLean as an assistant coach who has a history in the AHL. Like this coaching staff to me is built to be young player friendly. Yeah. And we've seen that like the bigger young guys are getting opportunities and like even younger guys that we've acquired, like Nikita Zadorov. Uh, who was only 25 or 26 when we got him, like, you know, like he's seen a huge amount of growth in his game. And, you know, Rajitska's emerged as a legit top nine forward and, you know, possible 30, 40, 50 point guy down the road. And, you know, like we're starting to see certain guys actually doing well. And it's like, why are certain guys being favored and not others when you know it, it, it like it just doesn't make a lot of sense so matt looking at sizes i'm trying to figure out who the next call-ups are um cole schwint 6-3 so he's probably going to come up yeah martin pospisil 6-2 he'll probably get a call up and a play like um i don't know it's just the gm is bringing these guys up for a reason and it's not a reward for the player to come on a road trip and sit in the press box if i was phillips or or peltier I'd probably rather be in the WHL playing than in the HL sitting in the press box. Yeah. So, you know, you they got to be scratching their heads too. And like you were talking about Coronado, but even these guys, when it comes time to re-sign, like, you know, what am I here? Am I just AHL fodder? I think, Yeah. I don't know, it, it's, it's frustrating. And, and even going back to the Markstrom well, like again, 
Daryl not putting that emphasis on the young guy in Vladar when maybe should be sometimes. I just, I don't know. I, I want, I'm wondering more and more, especially after this past week, if Daryl's time in the NHL is maybe past. Yeah. And it's one of those things that it's frustrating because like how the flames are playing, like you're starting to see this team being a really solid, potentially dangerous team in the playoffs. And yet just like something that should be basic and automatic, you know, like everybody has literally played every first round draft pick from Peltier's draft year in the NHL and allowed them to either sink or swim. Like first round draft picks are not bad or garbage players. We saw Chris Chucko play in the NHL and Greg Nemitz play in the NHL. Doesn't mean you're not a garbage player. No, but, but okay. you know, like even they got a shot is what I'm trying to get at. And you know, like it, it just doesn't make any sense. And like the flames, you know, like one thing I'm personally concerned about is, you know, like if you look at how the, the flames have drafted over the last number of years, they, they've placed a huge amount of emphasis on drafting skilled players, regardless of their size. And, yep. you know, like you see Rajitska who happened to be tall, but was very skilled and inconsistent along with all of the other miscellaneous middle sized and shorter guys. And it's like, are we going to see a return to like the draft picks, like the Matt Pellicks, the Chris Chuckos, the Greg Nemesis, the Mitch Walls, where like, okay, yeah, they're big, but they also suck at playing hockey, but they're big. So great. Let's draft them. Well, and, and that's interesting too, right? I mean, some of those picks were made when Daryl was the GM and Daryl picked very much just big Canadian boys was sort of his mo at the draft and we seem to have the gm picking one way and the coach wanting to play a completely different player and those have to be aligned and i think at the end of the season you either have to move the gm and find a guy who's going to bring you a daryl style player or if this doesn't change move the coach to play what we've got like yeah. I, I just i have to imagine there's some strife behind the scenes there that we're not seeing and i think you can probably get through the rest of the season with these two if you have to but if this continues, I have to imagine that ownership's going to have to move on from one of them. Yeah, and it's frustrating because of the fact that, like, you look at uh, the Calgary Wranglers, and they're not a veteran-laden team, and yet they're kicking the butt of everybody because of the young guys on the team. And the Connor Zaris, the uh, Elias uh, Pedersen, or no, um, Matthias Pedersen, um, you know, and the Phillips, the the Zars, and I'm not and saying that. the Peltier and, Phillips are going to come in and be our savior, but at least give them a shot. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where, like, Calgary is finally looking like they're developing players properly at, in terms of like AHL development, and like the team is being successful because of it. And it's like, why are you wanting to like throw all of that out just because? You know, they're not all six feet tall. Like, it, it's just, it's mystifying at this point. And, you know, like, it, it's like, oh, well, things are going well. Let's, you know, throw all the ingredients out that got you there. Like, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Do you expect to see Peltier play the uh, the Nashville game, the last game on this trip? Well, realistically, he has to play at some point. Like it, it, it becomes farcical. But does he? It, you know, it, if he does not play at all at this on this road trip, it's a farce. And you know, like it, then the Darryl, Nashville game is the last game of the trip. I know, and like that's where like it becomes a farce. And you know, like then it, it's like uh, now we have to have a big discussion on. Uh, what the heck Daryl's doing because like this is not you know and like we're if starting Darryl... to see that uh, in the national media too with Elliot Friedman criticizing him uh, on his last show and you know like it, it's getting to the point where like this is like there is something wrong here and well but that's what I'm saying like you know and I could see it we've got what f six more games this month and then we have the one week break Honestly, if there's something going on here, Matt, I would not be surprised. And we talked about this before Christmas. I would not be surprised 
right now, if we see a coaching change by the 28th, which is the last day of the Flames games this month. Yeah, well, if the Flames struggle at that point, and like... Even if they don't struggle, even if Daryl just, you know, keeps doing the same thing. I mean, okay, let's say even if they're not struggling, but if we keep going on the Markstrom well, I think it could happen too. Yeah, I know. Like, it's... You know, it, it's this team is. I don't want to see. No, I don't want to see Daryl leave, but he's just he's not making the right decisions, in my opinion. No, and it, it, like you can ar- always argue with the coaching staff's decisions, but uh, you know, like at least like you can understand when it makes sense. But like the decisions that are being made are nonsensical, which is what's like like why are you doing this like. It, like there's no justifiable reason why you don't give a guy like Pelte or Phillips, who are just absolutely tearing up the AHL, a shot. I, even if, you know, let them determine how good they are. Like if they, well, that's it. I'm I'm not saying you know take Lewis out of the lineup forever and always for the rest of the season. Give Peltier, you know, let's say the Chicago game. Okay, he played well, so let him earn his way into game two. And, you know, don't don't try to sabotage him, but as long as he keeps showing he should be there, keep him there. Yeah, and, you know, like, if the guy falls flat on his face, well, good for him, you know, and you, now well, you, you know you say, that hey, we, about Yeah, that we guy. put you on the second line, you're not a second line guy, we'll try on the third line guy, hey, that didn't work out, even if it doesn't fall on his face, it's just, you know what, he wasn't better than the guy you replaced, we'll send him back to, to the AHL. Yeah, and then you have that bit of knowledge, and that guy has knows what he needs to work and on. And the player development staff know what to work with him on. Yeah, uh, but it's like if you don't actually play the guy, how the hell is the guy supposed to learn? Or the team's supposed and it to just, learn? It, like, it, it's a... And it, uh, yeah, and it seems like the fact that Tree's bringing them up and Daryl's not playing them, it seems like there's got to be some contention there. Like, generally, the coach and the GM would be working together on who do you want, who do we bring up. It just seems like there's two different agendas. No, and, like, how do you say Like... The, there are certain types of players where it makes sense and it's actually better if you have bigger players. When it comes For to sure, the defense fourth men, line, I think Walker Dewar and Zahorn are the right guys. Yeah. And like the defense core, getting guys like Good Branson last year and uh, Zadorov, who are just massive defensemen, that beats guys that are six feet tall because they can push people out of the way. That is actually where size matters. You know, and like if the two guys are basically the same talent, get the bigger guy. That in that case makes sense. But sure, but you've also got guys like McCarr, and I think if you're talented enough, you can still survive oh yeah. in that role. No, and how would you say like that's where like rounding out your defense core with like massive yeah. guys. But like I just, the skill guys, uh, you know, are the skill guys. And like you know, if say Rasmus Anderson was five foot seven, but was putting up fifty points as a defenseman, you're like, sure, cool. You you go put up your points, and we'll surround you with big guys. <laughs> you know, to we've been we've been talking about this on Twitter all weekend at Fireside Podcast. We've had a lot of fans weighing in, but if anybody can figure out why Daryl is not playing Peltier, please let us know at facebook.com slash fireside chat we're at fireside podcast on twitter you can email us um, at our website firesidechat.ca leave us a voice memo on the website flash the bat signal we'll come running like if you've got the answer get it to us somehow send a carrier pigeon to the to my studio and just like nobody seems to understand this it's not just you and i i can't no and, the and, entire and, sea of red that we've talked to no one's getting it no and like i can understand like sitting guy like peltier phillips for a game or two here watch the speed of the nhl game adapt and then i'll play you and yeah, then I get, you know and that's what we thought when we talked about the chicago game you know what they're sitting them out to get them ready get them you know get them up here get them acclimatized and they'll go on in st louis yeah and then you nothing and like it, it's just like now it's just getting asinine frankly and you know, like, you're not doing a service to anybody, like, not the team on the ice, not the ownership, not the management, not the player specifically, his line mates potentially, none of it, just because, oh, well, he's short. Like, it, it's just, it's really... St- and again, we don't know that's the reason. No, We're but assuming. it's, a, you know, a strong assumption just because literally everybody over six feet tall, oh, come right in. You know, and like, oh, you haven't practiced? Oh, well, hop 
hop on over the boards. You're good. I was uh, I was out on the community rink yesterday playing a little bit of shinny, and there was a six year old there in a Johnny Goudreau jersey. I got confused for a sec. I'm like, oh wow, Johnny's back. Oh no, never mind. <laughs> Just from behind, I'm like, well, tall enough to be Johnny. It's probably real Johnny. And then I skate over, and it wasn't. I'm like, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, okay, so this Nashville game is the last game of the trip, and then we'll talk. Well, let's talk about the week ahead. So we've got one more game in Nashville on the road in Nashville. Then we come back for Colorado, Tampa Bay. You think he's going to play in Nashville, but you also thought he was going to play in St. Louis and St. Louis and Dallas. Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm not confident that Peltier sees the oh, ice no, in this road I, I trip. Doubt it. And I think as soon as he, and I think as soon as he comes home, he gets re- reassigned back to the start, back to the HL. Yeah. Well, at that rate, like if I'm true living, I just send Dewar down and, you know, threaten, waivers for anybody that's on the bench but again why do you need to threaten waivers at that point just change coaches i know well it, it, you know it's one of those things because waivers is going to hurt you more in the long term if somebody gets claimed oh, I, I agree and you know it's one of those where you know like if say like they had to wave say trevor lewis down to the farm and he gets claimed which he would then okay, I have to go spend a third round pick for, to go get that guy back, basically at the trade deadline. Thanks, Daryl. Well, yeah. and at that point, you don't spend the the currency. You just say here, pick one. You get Pelty or you get Phillips. That's your choice. Yep. Which one do you want? Like, yeah, you're not. You you wouldn't waste an asset on that. No, I, mean, I know, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. it's. I don't know. It's just like. Like I said, I like Daryl. I think Daryl's a good coach, but yeah, like this is just asinine for asinine's sake. Like, it, there's no logic at this point. Like, with how many games Phillips sat after the two games, and like the four games now that Peltier has sat on the sidelines, it's like, what are you doing? Like, and if neither guy got called up, I would sort of understand it. It's like, okay, the GM and the coach are on some sort of a have some agreement that these guys are better in the AHL this year. But the fact that they're getting called up and they're not getting played is what really confuses me. No, and it's not like a, a Tyler Watherspoon situation where, well, he's just the, the defenseman that's available. And so we'll just call him up. And if he plays well, or that's doesn't, why I who thought cares? Clark Bishop was going to be the first call up. He's the forward that's available. that wouldn't hurt the AHL team if he was gone for a week. Yeah. And you know, like that would make entire sense, but you know, like if you, when you have two or guys ben Jones. Uh, that are tearing up the league and, you know, you were, you're wanting to audition them at the NHL level just to see, you know, can they stick? You know, because we've seen guys like uh, take uh, Jake Gensel with Pittsburgh. Like he was having a similar season to what Phillips is having the year he got recalled. And then he ended up being one of the heroes for the Penguins as they went on to win the Stanley Cup and then has been pretty much a 40 goal scorer ever since then. That's not well, to say the it's other... the same player, but you know, you have to see what you've got. And and also the the Wranglers are doing well and the Flames seem like they want success down there. So when you're taking these top players out of the lineup for a week and doing nothing with them, you're hurting your HL team. And we saw that this week where they lost both games to Henderson. Yeah, like you could sort of sacrifice those games if you're saying, wow, we're getting great development for Pelty up here. But otherwise, it's like, what are we doing? Oh, I know. Why is he here? I know. Like, it's not... Usually, you're the one ranting on the show. This time, it's my turn. I know. <laughs> well... 11 seasons in, and I finally got to let it out. Yeah. Well, we're actually like, hitting almost 10 years to the day now that we're, we've we been doing this. And I think this is, like, the second or third time that you've ranted. So, you know, it's good. <laughs> it's not the time you ran on Daryl, and I just went and got a sandwich and let you keep going. But, yeah. <laughs> like, like, it's just... I, I don't get it. No, and, and like that's where like if you know say like you played Peltier after the Chicago game and played him in the first St. Louis game and he was objectively terrible, and then you sat him for a couple just so like okay work on this and this and this in the upstairs like look and see like what you have to do that would make perfect sense but like you're not even allowing any actual evaluation of the guy at the NHL level. Like, it's just, it does not make any sense. Well, no, it doesn't. But, Matt, let's get my blood pressure back down. We're running a little bit long. <laughs> let's talk about this, the week that's coming, shall yep. we? 
<sighs> Let me take a few deep breaths. <laughs> okay. All right. So the Flames have one more game of this road trip. They play Monday night in Nashville. That's a 6 p.m. start time. Then we have a Wednesday game back here in the Saddle Dome, a 7.30 start time. I always hate those weird 7.30s against the Colorado Avalanche. Then they get two days off, and the Tampa Bay Lightning come Saturday the 21st at 1 p.m. So three games on the docket. We didn't do all that great last week. Um, You thought that we'd win all three. I thought that we would uh, win the first St. Louis game and lose um, the, the second St. Louis game and the Dallas game. Oh, no, sorry. I thought I'd, we'd win the first St. Louis game and the Dallas game, lose the second St. Louis game. So they so split the backwards. difference, really. What are you thinking for this week? Uh, I'm going to go back to the well with three straight wins. What makes you confident of that? Uh, Vladar and that. <laughs> so you think Vladar for all three? Yep. It's really the way it's got to be, doesn't it? Pretty much. And Usually we're asking where Vladar plays. Where does Pelgier play? Yeah. Now, here's the question. Do you think that uh, Peltier plays this week? No. Me too. Should he? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I think he he plays the Nashville game, if any. And as soon as they get back to Calgary, he hauls his stuff to the dressing room down the hall, and he's back in the Wranglers. Yep. The only way he plays this week is if there's a coaching change, which I don't think would happen this early. No. I'm going to say the Flames are going to win the Nashville game and the Colorado game. I think they're going to lose to Tampa Bay. Yeah, I I, think, I actually agree. I, I'm just trying to be a little more optimistic. I think that, you know, Tampa Bay is still a very good team. I think it'll be a good measuring stick. Yeah. But I And I think if you can beat Colorado, even though they're having a bit of a crummy season, you beat the champs. I mean, I know it's not pro wrestling where we beat the champs, we become the champs. But I think, um, you know, I, I think that it, it does say something that you can beat the defending champs. Yeah, and to be fair to Colorado, like they're running through St. Louis's level of everybody hurt at the same time. So St. Louis still managed to beat us. Well, thanks, Markstrom. <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah. And I agree with you. I think that these, I think at least two of these games Markstrom's in. As I said earlier, I would play Markstrom in the Tampa, or I, sorry, I, I, at least two of these I think Vladar's in. I would play Vladar Nashville and, and Colorado. I would play Markstrom again. I'd play Vladar Nashville, Vladar Colorado. I'd play Markstrom Tampa Bay. Yeah, I agree. I think just giving them that shot and then go back to Markstrom for Columbus when Johnny's in town and Chicago. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, one thing that we didn't talk about uh, with the weekly recap, what are those third jerseys for Dallas? Like, oh my God, my eyes. <laughs> well, we we've talked about the uh the reverse retros earlier in the season yeah well that one's a, their actual third jersey and it's like like how bright do you need that jersey you know like but you know dallas has a history of crappy jerseys true. i mean remember that like uterus jersey or whatever they had yeah the muterus yeah yeah the, like you're right these neon ones are stupid but yeah i, I don't know there's only so much you can do there true with their same i mean with their same color scheme mm-hmm. and you know to me it's no different than say blasty you know it's neat and novel or you know the pedestal jersey is neat and novel i don't know the last more than a year yeah i agree but they call that new green skyline green that's the official name of it yeah <laughs> um i wish that i wish dallas would go back to their uh, early 2000s ones the ones with the star pattern on them yeah. those are my favorite dallas jerseys i agree Although I think it'd have to be like raised, like the Flames pedestal jerseys in certain parts. Well, that that could be their reverse retro next time. I don't know. Yeah. And speaking of star jerseys, we should remind everybody to uh, vote for your favorite All Star. Maybe you want to send. I don't know. Can we send Peltier to the NHL All Star game? He's already going to the AHL game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> send Walker Dewar, whoever you think should go for the Flames. Vote for them. You've got until the seventeenth. That's when voting closes. So maybe we can get. Milan Lucic there, or I, I don't know, maybe we can get Trevor Lewis there, but I, I figure maybe if we can get a short guy there, I don't know how many NHL games you need to be eligible, but can Daryl Sutter deny Pelty if he's an all-star? Yeah. <laughs> can he d- deny Phillips if he's an all-star? Yeah. Well, you're good enough for the all-star team, but you're not good enough for the Calgary Flames. <laughs> That's right. 
kid. That's just an exhibition game. <laughs> yep. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, there's no hitting in that one. <laughs> Lucci, however, he's got a ring, so he's going in. <laughs> so. Yep. <Yeah. laughs> Now, if you were as big as one of them Clydesdales I saw in St. Louis, we'd have a different discussion. <laughs> but you're a small pony. Like, come on. <laughs> That's right. You'd be at the petting zoo at the Stampede, son. I'm going to call you Little Sebastian from now on. <laughs> We've got Big Z, Little Z, or Big Z and Bigger Z, and now we're going to have, you know, Little Jacob. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, we will... Uh, hopefully my blood pressure will be down by next week and we'll see what we see from the flames in these three games yep and as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license for full license details visit firesidechat.ca